we had uh, firstly established based on um, the general conditions that we might impose on a, a differential CP map. Uh, if we have a differential map that is also a completely positive map, and if that differential map we take to be Markov, then the um, master of the state uh, evolves according to this differential equation. So if and only if state there. And this equation is what we call the master equation, uh, generally speaking, and it's in with those approximations that it's uh, CP Lindblad and CP Markov, then it's in the Lindblad form. And so that will generally have a Hamiltonian part and the remaining part that we call the dissipative uh, map. And that the Lindblad form is expressed here, okay, written in terms of a set of operators. And there's many different ways that we write that uh, kind of uh, the generator of that map here is sort of the standard one. In the literature, sometimes you'll see it written this way, uh, which is equivalent if you write out all those commutators. So you sometimes see this written in this manner. Um, and of course, if for, the, if for some reason, as we'll see as an example at some point, if the Lindblad operators were Hermitian operators themselves, then this would just equal uh, the double commutator of the Lindblad operator with rho. So that's another thing to see in the literature sometimes. And as we also discussed, we can, in addition, write this in a, another, what we will, what will become a somewhat familiar form as a, um, a commutator with this prime here is related to the fact that, of course, we have to take the Hermitian conjugate when we take the term in the opposite order. Uh, so this looks kind of like Hamiltonian evolution, but it includes decay, where uh, that non-Hermitian part of the Hamiltonian is, has this relation to the Lindblad operators. And then an additional term that we call the refeeding term. Okay. So all three of these forms you'll see in the literature. Yeah. In that second line, is there supposed to be another commutator on the second term, or is that? Yeah, I'm sorry. Okay. Yeah, indeed. Pardon me. Okay. Yes. Um, right. Um, and we furthermore discussed that we have to interpret these uh, operators at all. Uh, the Lindblad operators, which are the operators that uh, define the transition rates that are uh, associated with the dissipation. Okay, so if we have some in initial state and we want to know what is the decay rate to some final state that is imposed by the interaction of the system with the environment, then we take the square of that matrix element. And that tells us the transition rate for a particular process, which we haven't quite defined yet, mu, the total transition rate from that would be the sum over all mu. Of that. Um, and if we wanted to say what the way in which we wanted to interpret this decay term, if we look at the matrix element or the expectation value of this uh, non-hermitian part of the Hamiltonian, then that is nothing more than the total transition rate out of uh, F. Just leave that mu off. We haven't done the sum over mu out of i into all possible f, and that's a total uh, decay rate that we discussed last time. Okay. So this is the general structure of uh, the master equation. 
in limb-like form. And what we are doing now is um, deriving this from first principles where we explicitly look at the interaction of the system with the environment, um, where we treat both subsystems together as a closed system with unitary evolution between them, and then trace over the environmental degrees of freedom to be left with just the dynamics of the system alone, and that should, under some approximation, give us this equation. It's now being raised. Any questions about any of that? Okay. It's going to be a lot of erasing this. Um, so, so maybe yeah, one, one question. So yeah. the, uh, um, the, uh, the the decay rate. This the, total rate. Yeah, the total rate is independent of the of the uh, representation, right? How you represent the limit operators. That's not quite correct. Okay. Yeah. So so it's not correct. So it yeah. depends. Uh, even though it's uh, a mathematical convenience to work in one representation or the other, you, you say that the, 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 the decay rate will depend on that. I believe that's true. Let me think about that for a moment. Yes, it will. Um, As we, will, as we will study in, in a few weeks, one way to interpret uh, these two different parts of the dissipation, the decay part and the refeeding part, is um, whether or not um, we, the environment contains information about the decay. So if I think about the system of a two-level atom, which we will, that can spontaneously decay, then, well, let's suppose it's in some superposition of ground and excited, but we don't know initially what that superposition is. Now, I can imagine monitoring the spontaneous emission with detectors that are, say, surrounding the Saturn and 4 pi. If I see a spontaneous emission, then I immediately know that the atom had to have gone from excited to ground, in which case the atom collapses into the ground state conditioned on my having seen that photon. In some sense, measuring the photon is a measurement of the atom. If I don't see the photon, well, that's also a measurement. Because if I don't see the photon, then I, have, I should say, well, it's more likely, in fact, that the atom wasn't in the uh, excited state. It was more likely to have been in the ground state. Of course, that's not a projective measurement. But I should, in some sense, say, in some way, update my state assignment here based on the fact that ha having, for some time interval, not seen the uh, spontaneous emission, it's more likely at that point the atom's in the ground state and less likely in the excited state. So I should change that and make that bigger and that smaller. Now, there is a, a rigorous way in which we can interpret that in terms of the master equations. but the point and how this connects, although I'm not 100% sure of this, and I'll have to come back and think about it for the next lecture, is that the way in which this update happens depends upon the measurement that I do on the environment. 
So if I do photon counting, well then that is some amount of information change. But on the other hand, suppose that I take this photon and I beat it with a local oscillator, a laser field, and do homodyne detection on this. Well then, I gain different information about these states. And so the, the effect of Hamiltonian is different. So I believe, I'm pretty sure that is the case, that the way in which I divide, yeah, it must be true, the way in which I divide the master equation in terms of decay and refeeding is not unique. And what is true is the total dynamics is the same, but, that the, but there's an arbitrary number of possible divisions that I can make. And so the, the decay, what I'm calling the decay, the total decay, uh, that system depends on, it's really, it is a, 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 a particular representation of the master equation. It's not unique. But, but it's a very subtle point if I had to work it out. And we'll return to this whole picture, a little preview. This is the theory of quantum trajectories. So in that set up, yeah. you can think of this as doing a projective measurement if you see a photon and not doing a projective measurement but doing a continuous measurement if you don't see a photon. That's correct. Uh, and then what is the, the bottom line is that the master equation is the situation where you throw away the measurement record because you're not actually keeping track of the environment. So the total evolution is the ensemble average over all possible measurement records that could have happened. But that's for another time. So let's continue though where we were. We'll come back to that. Okay. Um, right. So um, what we were discussing at the end of the last lecture, we were looking at this uh, system reservoir or system environment derivation of the master equation. Okay? So the scenario that we're looking at is one of the following. We have our system there's some state, we want to know how it evolves as a function of time. And the way in which it evolves in time is due to its coupling to some environment. But we're looking at the situation where, in some sense, what's happening is fresh copies <coughs> of the environment are being coupled to the system in, e in a small time interval, okay? So again, I think a physical picture is to think about thermalization in which equilibrium reservoir fluid is constantly being refreshed in its interaction with the system that's out of equilibrium with the reservoir and the part of the, the atoms that had interacted with the system go back into the environment or re-thermalized and information is lost, okay? So that we take this equilibrium system to be whatever, it's, some, it's whatever it was at time t equals zero. But it doesn't mean that the system doesn't evolve because in each little chunk of time there are some correlations that are created between the system by when they just fly off. So that's the physical picture that is part of our Markov, it's part of the Markov approximation, not the whole Markov approximation, but part of it. Okay? And where we got last time was say, okay, if I had my total Hamiltonian was a Hamiltonian for the system plus a Hamiltonian for the environment plus an interaction Hamiltonian that if we 
integrate, so we integrate the Schrodinger equation. over a coarse graining time <clears throat> delta t. Okay? And that delta t is assumed to be tiny compared to the correlation time <coughs> between, or I should say, the correlation time for the reservoir. That is to say, before the information about any correlations that were established between the system and the reservoir to disappear. Again, picturing this picture of dropping a hot coin into the lake, there's a very short time in which the local atoms come out of equilibrium with the reservoir, but then very quickly they rethermalize. This is sort of the, we think about as a rethermalization time, although as we say it's not more generalized. General that. But by the time it's big compared to whatever the decay time or the dissipation time for which this thing changes. The other way around, isn't it? Yeah, like all the rate. I think about it as rates, but I wrote it as times. Sorry. So this is tiny, and this is big, compared to the coarse grain of times. So from the point of view of the system, this is a differential time. But from the point of view of the reservoir, this is infinite time. So it requires a very large uh, spread between these time scales. And when we did that, what we found was, uh, so in second order perturbation, we found that The change in the system's density matrix, right, that is the density matrix at t plus dt minus the density matrix at t, was approximately equal to minus 1 over h bar squared, the integral from t to t plus dt, or <coughs> delta t, dt prime from t to t prime, dt prime stuff, and that stuff looked like the following. Interaction uh, at T prime, interaction at T double prime, average over the environment, rho system at T, minus traced over the environment, and everything is written here in the interaction picture. Okay, so that's where we were last time. Okay, so, um, as I mentioned at the end of the lecture, we can kind of see, beginning to come into focus a little bit, how this map or this differential change in the density matrix 
is beginning to look something like the wind platform, right, with operators that multiply grow and operators that conjugate grow. Um, as was emphasized, these things are still system operators, right, even though we've taken the trace over the environment because they involve joint system plus environment operators. Okay, so to make some progress on this, um, let's look at a specific example, the iconic example of uh, quantum optics, which is the problem of the K of an atom in the presence of uh, the quantized electromagnetic field. Okay. It's one of two problems we ever really care about. The other one is the decay of the simple harmonic oscillator. Pretty much it. Um, okay, so let's look at, let's, although many of the conclusions we're going to, to draw, or all of them pretty much, uh, are um, the same as what we'll see for this specific example. It's just easier to talk about the context of this of a specific example. So let's do that. So let's consider the example uh, master equation for two level atom in a reservoir black body radiation. Now this is a slight generalization of what we studied previously. Of course the vacuum <coughs> is the case where the black body is at zero temperature. But we'll just allow in general the case of finite temperature uh, reservoir of electromagnetic field. Okay. Just to make it a little bit more general. Um, I mean, of course, that's, things aren't, I should just mention, just, just as a point of question. Um, I mean, always we are not at zero temperature, so why don't I always have to do this? I mean, if I'm thinking about the spontaneous emission of a two-level atom, at say optical frequency, why don't I have to worry about the effect of the black body photons on the decay rate from side to round? Because there are many. There are pretty much none, right? Because of course the average number of photons at a given frequency is what? The Planck distribution, right? I mean, they, and God, I forgot that. I mean, but yes, you remember that. Come on, that's either the h bar k, h bar omega over k Boltzmann t minus one, right? That's the Planck distribution. That's the mean number of photons. And of course, uh, you have to ask the question: How big is k t compared to h bar omega? Well, room temperature. Think about that, 1 40th of an EV, right? And you, right, so all that stuff. There are numbers, it's physics after all. And this is just tiny when you're at optical frequency. So you just ignore it. Now, of course, if I was at, you know, something like gigahertz, well, then I have to worry about it. So if I'm talking about Rydberg atoms, yeah, you might have to worry about black body. Okay, but, you know, we, when well, we're usually thinking about a laser at optical frequencies, then we don't. So anyway, come back to that. Okay. Um, right. So let's. So our fundamental Hamiltonian now is the Hamiltonian for the atom plus the Hamiltonian for the field plus the interaction Hamiltonian. The field is the environment. 
Um, and uh, so the Hamiltonian for the atom is, we take this as a two-level atom that we're looking at the decay near our resonance, so we have our usual kind of thing in our two-level approximation as we've written down from the early days of the course, the field Hamiltonian is just a free field, which is the harmonic oscillators with written in our usual box quantization manner, although we don't really have which is more convenient. You represents the polarization here of the mode. And then we have the interaction Hamiltonian. in the rotating wave approximation. So this harks back to our studies from last semester. Where H bar G is coupling energy is the dipole matrix element guided into the electric field for one photon. Interaction picture. God, I wish I had a bigger board, but <laughs> oh well. Is that G supposed to be uh, a star? star? Yeah. And generally, it would be these are complex stuff. Yeah. Yep. Okay, so you have your notes. The atomic operators evolve, and the mode operators for the fields evolve. And my interaction Hamiltonian in the interaction picture takes the following form. H bar times something I'm going to call the field reservoir operator. Plus the conjugate term. So that's the form we have where the, I'll call this the reservoir operator. F here is the sum over the modes, GK mu, AK, state of the environment
the one that occurs in our Markov uh, expectation values to be um, well, it's a tensor product over all the modes of this for the kth mode. equal to a thermal state over the partition function. Right. Which can be written, if we like, in terms of Presentation in the number basis. Right? That's our thermal. State. The thermal state, this is the, uh, that's, that's just the Planck distribution. Okay. And of course, when the temperature goes to zero, then this is the vacuum. So we have that particular case as a, as a uh, as a specific example. Okay. All right. So, what can we say about the reservoir based on, uh, or the field, the, the reservoir field operator based on this state? Well, firstly, recall. Well, we can, it's easy to see here that if I look at the expectation value of any creation annihilation operator, it's zero. The mean is zero. The environment is a field. I'm kind of interchanging that notation. Right? Because the expectation value of the annihilation operator or creation operator in a Fox state is zero. Okay. S uh, similarly, we have that um, the expectation value of a dagger with A between two modes is zero unless the two modes are equal, and in which case that's the mean number of photons in that mode by the Planck distribution. Right? And similarly, um, the expectation value in the other order is going to be n bar plus 1. Just using the commutator. So from that, we learned something about uh, this field operator, what we have is that the mean of this reservoir operator, F, or F dagger, is zero. That's why 
when we did our derivation of the uh, integration over the time scale delta t, we had to go to the second order because there's no first order shift on the system due to the reservoir because it has mean field zero. Typically, the reservoir will have, if it's fluctuations, doesn't have a mean value, it only has higher order moments, i.e. fluctuations. Um, moreover, we see from this, oh, I didn't write down, yes, this is also true. If I look at products, any, any, to any power, but for example, that's zero, that's also zero. Right? Because a Fox state has zero expectation for any power of A or A dagger. So it's also true that the correlation function F with F prime or F dagger with F dagger is also zero. Because they'll involve products like this or this. So we're left with considering the other two correlation functions. Um, the correlation of F with F or F dagger. Let's just write this now. T1 at another time T2. So that's equal to, by definition, the sum over K and U, the square of this amplitude, this coupling coefficient, the mean number of photons in the mode at that frequency, e to the um, i omega k, t1 minus t2. And that's the kind of thing we studied last semester. You study in your basic statistical physics of thinking about a black body ratio and stuff like this. This is if I go from the box quantization to the continuum and turn this into an integral over the density of states, as we studied and reviewed last semester, and you all looked at all those lectures and remind remember all that stuff now yourselves. Average over the polarizations uh, times n bar. So this is that function, or this is the density of states. Okay, and similarly, if we were to do the same calculation of the correlation of F with F dagger, we would get the same thing, but with an N bar plus one. Okay, notice if the temperature were zero, this correlation function would be zero, but this correlation function would not because of the n plus 1, that's the extra spontaneous photon, if you like. Okay. All right. Um, now, I want to study this function a little bit more. It's a very important function that we'll see plays an important role in the whole discussion about open quantum systems.
Okay, so let me define a call um, K1 of T1 and T2 F dagger T2 and K2 the other way around. These are what we call the reservoir correlation functions. Okay. They relate to the correlation of the reservoir with itself at two different times. Okay. Now, one thing we see from the uh, in the particular case of the cis of the environment that we've chosen as a thermal equilibrium environment, is that this uh, correlation function has some familiar properties that we've seen before. Which includes the bad vacuum. One, we have stationarity, meaning that the correlation function, I'll just leave off its indices because it's true for either of them. The correlation function doesn't depend independently on the, of those two times, but depends only on the time difference between them. Okay. Moreover, if I define uh, so K of tau, if I take its complex conjugate, then that gives me uh, K a minus tau. So now when I give it one argument, it's the argument that corresponds to that time difference. Really, if I was being careful about mathematics, these, I can't, these are two different functions, right? One's a function of two arguments, but you get my sloppy physics point. Um, right, so for so what this tells me, for example, is that the real part of this correlation function is symmetric. That is, say it's equal to the real part, k okay, at minus. Okay. The real part of both sides of that equation. So, with the, what that tells me is, if I look at, for example, the real, the imaginary part is anti-symmetric, but it's the real part that we really will see is the important part that we really care about in understanding these disputed dynamics. So if I were to sketch this the real part of a, one of these correlation functions as a function of time, tau, typically it will look like the following. Some symmetric function. It's typically peaked at tau equals zero, and then falls off when tau increases in magnitude. And the width of this function is some characteristic time scale, tau c, which is, as we'll see, is the correlation time. So the temporal width of this function is telling me something about how correlated are these field operators with each other at two different times? When the time gets sufficiently large, then there is no correlation. This should go to zero. And the time scale over which that falls off 
is the characteristic time scale that correlations exist. And that is the correlation time. Note, I can also define, consider it the Fourier transform. So something about the spectral width of this function, S, tells me something about the correlation time here. So if this correlation function, if for example the spectral function were flat, if it, was in, if it were independent a frequency, then the inverse for a transform would be a delta function. So the Markov approximation is essentially the approximation that the Bath correlation function is white noise. So the Markov approximation is equivalent to a white noise uh, approximation. of reservoir fluctuations. It's to say that the fluctuations associated with the reservoir are just effectively infinite bandwidth compared to the dynamics, dynamical time scales associated with the system alone. So it, when one talks about uh, an approximation beyond the Markov approximation, one often talks about colored noise reservoirs, reservoirs that are not flat but have some spectrum associated with them. Okay? All right, so with that, we can now plug back in our expression for the interaction Hamiltonian of the form that we saw, uh, before, that we had written down, plug that in, and get the following. Prime minus t double prime 
f at t prime, f dagger at t double prime. And then I have the other way around. plus the permission conjugate of those two terms. So that just comes from plugging in our form of the interaction. Okay, so now what are we going to do? Well, so the way to proceed is firstly, let's change variables to the time difference between t prime and t double prime, because we know that our correlation function ultimately only depends on that. So we're going to change variables. How is the time difference between t prime and t double prime? And I'm going to define our favorite letter c as the you know, one other variable, we'll call it t prime minus t, because it's, it's a nice variable to look at. So I have to change variables here. It's a little bit complicated because of the limits of integration. So the domain over which I'm integrating is a little bit complicated. So let's draw that picture. So if I look in the t prime, t double prime plane, okay, this is the line t double prime equals t prime, which is equivalent to tau equals zero. Okay? And so t prime goes from t to t plus delta t. Right? And t double prime goes from, I'm integrating over these little, whatever you call them. Oops. Who, uh, who's a was it pieces of integration? I forgot what they call them. But they tried to try. No, no, not trapezoids, but whoever's name it was. The Riemann. Yeah. I'm doing my Riemann sum this way, right? I think it's what it's called. I forget. It's the Riemann sum. Yeah, yeah. Um, right? So that's my, that's my integration. Where this is t. And this is plus delta t. Okay. Um, so now, so this point, let me call it A, this point is B, and this point is C. And now I have to translate this into the tau C plane. All right. So A is at the, oh, let's see, A has tau equals zero, c equals zero. B is also tau equals zero, but c equals delta t. Right? And c uh, is at um, tau equals delta t, c equals delta t. Right? So that looks like then the following. So this is A, this is B, this is C. This is delta t, delta t. And now I'm integrating my, you know, this so this got mapped to that, and that got mapped to that, so I'm doing this kind of integral. So 
so that means that the integral with, from t to t plus delta t dt prime t to t prime t double prime is an integral over tau from 0 to delta t and c from tau to delta t. Because it goes from the line c equals tau. Okay. So, uh, let me just double check something. I think that looks good. Yep. All right, so I'm going to erase this thing and put in this is an integral uh, d tau dc tau to delta t and from zero to delta t. Okay, and I'm going to use the fact that this was stationary. Because it has to go from this line, yeah. which is the line C equals tau. But is that not like the upper limit? On that? Sorry? Isn't that the upper limit? Uh, isn't it from zero to tau? Zero to tau. No. I'm quite sure this is correct. The triangle is the no. Because I, I, you've got the other triangle, it seems like you're integrating over. From C equals tau delta to delta t. So, to see is the x axis, so you want to go from x equals 0 to x equals tau on the x axis if you're doing the upper triangle. I may have messed this up, and I'll look at this afterwards, but I know this is correct. So I'll look at that part afterwards. But it's not important. Believe me, this is correct. I will go back to these integrals to, to this domain, because it's not worth anything. I'll come back and look at that afterwards. But let's not obsess over that point. Trust me, this is correct. And I'll explain it more next time. OK. so. Um, given that, you want to change those exponents to tau? I do. Thank you. So let's do that. All right. So now we can uh, we make some more approximations that. We will hopefully prove are, are uh, perfectly valid. Excellent approximations. As we said, this thing falls off extremely rapidly with tau. It falls off uh, and goes to essentially zero for tau that is anything bigger than the correlation time. Moreover, this integral over tau, I mean, this integral up to from whatever tau is up to delta t, delta t is huge compared to the correlation time, right? So in principle, I mean, we could just say this is up to the correlation time because that is, after the correlation time, this thing falls off. Uh, but in the Markov approximation, we take that correlation time to zero. That's the absolute delta correlation. So without 
any, losing anything if the correlation time is absolutely tiny compared to anything else, then we can take the limit of the bottom integration to zero. So that's the Markov approximation of delta correlated So, with that, um, we, this integral over C <coughs> falls out of the problem, and we get this. And so I know it has that bit now, even if I screwed up the way I did my domain of the integration. All right. So now delta t or delta tau? Delta t. Delta t. Delta t. Okay, so what we're left with is to consider these integrals. So this integral you need to consider the integral from over tau to e to the i tau times f of tau, f dagger, zero. <laughs> yep. Okay. So this we can, if we plug back in what we had just written earlier in the lecture in terms of the density of states and all of that, then this has the following form. This has the form of the integral over the density of states, the coupling constant squared n bar, in this case, plus 1, times a function that we have defined going back to bigger weisskopf when we first studied spontaneous emission. And this function is equal to a delta function evaluated at the difference frequency between the frequency of the mode and the atomic resonance and Cauchy's principal part of 1 over the energy denominator. So that's something we studied in the past. I don't want to rederive it. Effectively, it comes from the fact that this is effectively delta correlated, which is to say the density of states is effectively, effectively white noise over the spectrum that we're uh, integrating over, which allows us to effectively take this limit to infinity. There does seem to be a tremendous amount of rapid hand-waving of things going to zero and things going to infinity. And it is one of the aspects of this derivation that's never completely satisfying until you go through it a number of times. But it really comes down to the strong separation of time scales of the correlation time of the map compared to <coughs> the evolution time of the system. That, that some things can be taken to call infinity and other things can be called effectively zero. Okay, so this is what we have and so when we uh, get that, plug that back in, we get the following, that this integral is equal to <coughs> r plus one down over two minus i over h bar, something we call the energy shift, which it depends, where gamma 
is equal to this um, 2 pi times the density of states at that frequency and this coupling constant, which is equal to 4 thirds the dipole matrix element squared. It's a better chalk, so my handwriting is a little bit more legible. And the energy level shift is the principal part of the integral over all the frequencies, n bar plus 1 times the coupling constant squared over the energy denominator. So that's delta E. And this is the familiar form of second order perturbation theory of the energy level shift perturbed by a time dependent field. Okay? It's the square of the major element squared over the energy denominator. This is what we call the light shift. Actually, it's the light shift plus a piece of lamb. Yummy. It's a piece of a lamp shift. It's not the whole lamp shift because we've made the rotating wave approximation and all that stuff. So well, what, we, what we see here is there's a part, the part that had to do with the real part of the reservoir has a decay term in it. The imaginary part of the reservoir is involved in some perturbative shifts in energy to the system. So the coupling of the system to the environment has two effects. One effect is the environment can, due to second order perturbations, shift the energies of the system. Even the vacuum does that. That's the lamp shift. But in addition, if the environment has things beyond vacuum, like thermal fluctuations, those, that thermal energy will also shift it. That's not the important point that we are focused on here. What we're more focused on it is the part that has to do not with the perturbative perturbations in the energy levels, but the part that has to do with the irreversible dynamics. So let's plug it all back in together. Oh, by the way, if I had done this in the other order, with F dagger and then F, I would have gotten the same thing except without the N plus 1, which is the N. So with that said, we can write down the final form of the math. imaginary part of the correlation function. And then the following terms.
And that's our final answer. So let's just absorb that for a moment. What we have derived under the assumption that our correlation function was equal to gamma bar n bar plus one delta tau plus i times something and the correlation. under the wigner weisskopf approximation, essentially, that our correlation functions are delta correlated, that delta correlation is the Markov approximation. Under these approximations, under this approximation, we end up with this form of the master equation. This master equation, this should be a minus, pardon me, This master equation is in Lindblad form. What are the jump operators? Sigma minus plus. So we have two kinds, right? I, we have a Lindblad operator, which I'll call L absorption, which is the square root of gamma n bar. N bar here is n bar at omega equals, that's at that particular frequency, sigma, uh, sigma plus. And then we have an emission, which is gamma n bar plus 1, sigma minus. We have two kinds of jump operators. One that is associated with absorption of photons from the reservoir, and one that's associated with emissions of photons into the reservoir. And the rates at which they occur depend upon the temperature of the reservoir as well as the Einstein A coefficient. Okay. So in addition, the reservoir gives me a, a energy level shifts, which we typically will reabsorb into the definition of the energy levels of the atom. Okay. Certainly, we would do that in the context of the lamp shift that defined the, the we, we normalized energy levels. And so, this is in the interaction picture. If I go back to the Schrodinger picture, then I would add this is a free atom. And we reabsorb this together to be the new atomic Hamiltonian. Right. Okay. Well, I think we'll call it quits there. Um, the derivation, you know, it has just these couple of spots where it looks like the rabbit went in the hat. But it really, again, does come back to this approximation that the reservoir correlation time is effectively zero, so that there's a delta correlation. Notice, though, one interesting thing, we're going to return to this, that the strength of the correlations, that is to say, 
the area under the curve of the delta function is proportional to decay rates. So this is an example of non, from non-equilibrium dynamics that we're going to return to soon. This is an example of what's known as the fluctuation dissipation relation. Or sometimes theorem. That is to say, the effect of the fluctuating reservoir is to cause dissipation. And the correlation strength is a measure of the rate at which that dissipation happens. This is something that was well known well before uh, probably quantum mechanics was happening sort of you know, the mammal amongst the dinosaurs uh, back in, in the days that the fluctuation dissipation theorem was being developed. But it was developed first in the context of Brownian motion. And so we're going to glean a lot in thinking about Brownian motion in trying to understand uh, the way in which quantum noise differs in any way from classical noise and what are the unique features that uh, are associated with decoherence in our system. All right, where we're headed then, what we're going to do on Thursday is that we're going to revisit this master equation. This is a master equation, at least in the case at zero temperature, where this term wasn't here. We only had this term. We, this gave rise to something like the optical block equations studied last semester. We'll revisit those, remind ourselves about them, and in addition then turn our attention to the other iconic example in quantum optics, the um, master equation for a damped simple harmonic oscillator, and look at those specific examples uh, and their relationships to the Brownian motion problem. So that's, that's on the agenda. All right? Very good. Expectation value of this uh, non Hermitian part of the Hamiltonian, then that is nothing more than the total transition rate out of uh, F. Let me just leave that U off. We haven't done the sum over mu. Out of I into all possible F, and that's a total uh, decay rate that we discussed last time. So this is the general structure of uh, the master equation in limb-like form. And what we are doing now is um, deriving this from first principles where we explicitly look at the interaction of the system with the environment um, where we treat both systems subsystems together as a closed system with unitary evolution between them and then trace over the environmental degrees of freedom to be left with just the dynamics of the system alone and that should under some approximation give us this equation it's now being raised any questions about any of that? Okay. It's going to be a lot of erasing this. This class. All right. Um, so. So maybe, yeah, one, one question. So yeah. the, uh, um, the, the the, the decay rate. This I total think, rate. Yeah, the total rate is independent of the of the uh, representation, right? How you represent the Lindblad operators. That's not quite correct. Okay. We had uh, firstly established based on um, the general 
conditions that we might impose on a, a differential CP map. Uh, if we have a differential map that is also a completely positive map, and if that differential map we take to be Markov, then the um, master B state uh, evolves according to this differential equation, if and only if state there. And this equation is what we call the master equation, uh, generally speaking, and it's in with those approximations that it's uh, CP Lindblad and CP Markov, then it's in the Lindblad form. And so that will generally have a Hamiltonian part and the remaining part that we call the dissipative uh, map. And that the Lindblad form is expressed here, okay, written in terms of a set of operators. And there's many different ways that we write that uh, kind of uh, the generator of that map here is sort of the standard one. In the literature, sometimes you'll see it written this way, uh, which is equivalent if you write out all those commutators. So you sometimes see this written in this manner. Um, and of course, if for, if for some reason, as we'll see as an example at some point, if the Lindblad operators were Hermitian operators themselves, then this would just equal uh, the double commutator of the Lindblad operator with row. So that's another thing to see in the literature sometimes. And as we also discussed, we can, in addition, write this in a, in a measurement of the app. If I don't see the photon, well, that's also a measurement. Because if I don't see the photon, then I, have, I should say, well, it's more likely, in fact, that the atom wasn't in the uh, excited state. It was more likely to have been in the ground state. Of course, that's not a projective measurement. But I should, in some sense, say, in some way, update my state assignment here, based on the fact that ha having for some time interval not seen the uh, spontaneous emission, it's more likely at that point the atoms in the ground state and less likely in the side state. So I should change that and make that bigger and that smaller. Now there is a, a rigorous way in which we can interpret that in terms of the master equations, but the point and how this connects, although I'm not 100% sure of this, I'll have to come back and think about it for the next lecture is that the way in which this update happens depends upon the measurement that I do on the environment. So if I do photon counting, well then that is some amount of information change. If on the other hand, suppose that I take this photon and I beat it with a local oscillator, a laser field, and do homodyne detection on this. Well, then I gain different information about these states. And so the, the effective Hamiltonian is different. So I believe, I'm pretty sure that is the case, that the way in which I divide, yeah, it must be true, the way in which I divide the master equation in terms of decay and refeeding is not unique. And what is true is the total dynamics is the same, but that the, but there's an arbitrary number of other what we will what will become a somewhat familiar form as a um, a commutator with this prime here is related to the fact that of course we have to take the Hermitian conjugate when we take to determine the opposite order. Uh, so this looks kind of like Hamiltonian evolution, but it includes decay, where uh, that non-hermitian part of the Hamiltonian is, has this relation to the Lindblad operators. And then an additional term that we call the refeeding term. Okay. 
So all three of these forms you'll see in the literature. Yeah. In that second line, is there supposed to be another commutator on the second term, or is that? Yeah, I'm sorry. Okay. Yeah, indeed. Pardon me. Okay. Yes. Um, right. Um, and we furthermore discuss that we have to interpret these uh, operators at home. Uh, the Lindland operators, which are the operators that uh, define the transition rates that are uh, associated with the dissipation. Okay, so if we have some in initial state and we want to know what is the decay rate to some final state that is imposed by the interaction of the system with the environment, then we take the square of that matrix element. And that tells us the transition rate for a particular process, which we haven't quite defined yet, mu, the total transition rate from that would be the sum over all mu of that. Um, and if we wanted to say what the way in which we wanted to interpret this decay term, if we look at the matrix element or the x, yeah. So, so it's not clear. So it yeah. depends, uh, even though it's a, a mathematical convenience to work in one representation or the other, you, you say that the, 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 the decay rate will depend on that. I don't think that's true. Let me think about that for a moment. Yes, it will. Um, as we will as we will study in in a few weeks, one way to interpret uh, these two different parts of the dissipation, the decay part and the refeeding part, is um, whether or not um, we, the environment contains information about the decay. So if I think about the system of a two-level atom well, that can spontaneously decay, then, well, let's suppose it's in some superposition of ground and excited, but we don't know initially what that superposition is. Now, I can imagine monitoring the spontaneous emission with detectors that are, say, surrounding this atom in 4 pi. If I see a spontaneous emission, then I immediately know that the atom had to have gone from excited to ground, in which case the atom collapses into the ground state conditioned on my having seen that photon. In some sense, measuring the photon is